Praise the Lord. The scripture for today is the 13th chapter of the New Testament book, 1 Corinthians. The 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians and is found on page 1785 in the Pew Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, page 1785 in the Pew Bible. After you have found it, please say amen. It reads, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now, we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Amen. It's such a blessing to have Carrie Whitson back with us today, directing the choir. She's going to lead us in a song called, How Excellent Is Thy Name. Can you say those words with me? How excellent is? How excellent is. How excellent is. How excellent is. How excellent is thy name. How excellent is thy name. All right. You just complete a choir rehearsal, so come on and sing along with us. One, two.
can see everything he's done for us we have to give him the praise praise for the to you. Why are you sitting? You should be standing praising God. How excellent. So I want this side of the congregation to sing with me. How excellent. Ready and how excellent. Oh, how excellent. How excellent. Each and every side. How
give God some praise if you know he's an excellent God. I don't know about you, but I can't sit in my seat and not think about the goodness and how excellent is the name of God. Didn't he wake you up this morning? Didn't he start you on your way? Didn't he put food on your table, clothes on your back? If God's been excellent to you, if God's been excellent to you, how about you just give him a five seconds of your praise? Y'all sound good, John. <laughs> Amen. Give our musicians a beautiful round of applause. Give this choir a great round of applause. But when I saw the, the program, I, I thought I was going to say, Oh, Lord, how excellent. How excellent. How excellent, how excellent he How excellent, how excellent he is, is your name. I like this. Sorry, I'm getting happy up here. Son of God, you're, you're excellent. I know, I know, I know, I know. Send your excellent. your name. God, we thank you because there's none like you in all the earth. I looked all over and I couldn't find nobody. I searched high and low and I still couldn't find nobody because now for myself, I know you're excellent. God, even if I ain't got a voice, I'm going to shout until I can't say nothing. That you're worthy, that you're mighty, that you're majestic, that everything in, in all the earth belongs to you. So God bless us. Speak, Lord. For your people needs to hear a word from you. Touch, Lord. For we need to feel you. Move, Lord, because we need shifting. And God, may the words of our mouths and meditations of all of our hearts, minds, and souls be acceptable in thy sight. Oh, Lord, you are our strength. And God, you're truly our redeemer. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. And we give you the praise. In the precious name of your son, Jesus, the risen Christ, we do pray that every heart and mind say amen. Amen. I, there is a word from the Lord, and if you could turn with me to the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel, 
the third chapter. And if you can stand all over the church for the reading of God's word, 1 Samuel, the third chapter. And that's where God has landed us for this day. And as you're standing up, whether you have your iPad, your iPhone, or your Bibles, you can just hold them up. I'll add Androids too for my wife. And say, this is my Bible. This is my Bible. And this is my guide to living. This is my guide to living. This is my Bible. This is my Bible. And this is my guide to living. First Samuel, the third chapter. And if you can just bear with me in this passage. And pray with me as I wrestle with this voice. But I know God is able. God is able. Even when I'm not. First Samuel, the third chapter, and it reads as such. If you found it, just say amen. If you need a little help, just tell me, Reverend Bajo, hold on. I'm waiting. Third chapter, First Samuel, page 420. Page 420 in the Old Testament. Amen. Amen. 420, First Samuel, the third chapter. I got time, don't worry. Amen. And when you found it, just say amen. amen. And the word of God reads as such. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. And in those days, the word of the Lord was rare. And there were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, here am I. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am. You called me? But Eli said, I ain't call you. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. My son, Eli said, I, I, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not know yet the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time, the Lord called Samuel and Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go lie down. And if he calls you, Say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, see, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from the beginning to the end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sins that he knew about. His sons blasphemed God. And he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of, to home, the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Samuel laid down until the morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision. But Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son, Samuel answered, here I am. What was it he said to you? Eli asked, do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely if you hide me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, 
He is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel was the attested as prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and these revealed, there he revealed to himself and to Samuel through his word. And Samuel's word came to all of Israel. Thank you for being patient with me, but if I could preach from a topic, I'd preach, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Uh, my brothers and sisters, um, I was on vacation and me and my wife were, were counting some past memories. And I was telling her about how we used to have to wake up early in the morning on Sundays to get ready for church. Now this might sound like a very normal story, but, but let me let you in a little bit to the insights of my brothers and I's lives for a moment. See, our father pastored some hour and 15 minutes away from our home in Atlanta, Georgia. After he moved from his church after 10 years and moved down to preach in Watkinsville, Georgia, 10 miles outside of Athens. And so for us to get ready to church, we had to get up way earlier than normal for church folk to get to where we need to get. And as I was thinking about this, I started to laugh because I remember my mother and father screaming, Willie Winston Weldon, it's time to get up. Now, um, if you knew me, you know that uh, it's sometimes hard for me to get immediately up. And so I, I had this little trick I used to play, uh, and God forgive me, but they'd call me, I'd say, yes. And I'd close my eyes and tell my parents, I'm praying. <laughs> and so they Willie, what's the world? Y'all love us? Yeah, I'm praying. And every Sunday I go through this game, and my wife said I still do it today, but, um, but every once in a while, but, but I, I knew that when my parents called on me, they were warning me to get ready to do something that was necessary for us to get to church. And I was reminded of those moments in this third chapter of Samuel where we, we, we find Samuel hearing from God and he calls this young man into his work. And, and what we see, the text tells us that the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. And in those days, the Bible says that, 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 that the Lord's words was rare and that there were not many visions. Now you must understand that Samuel was the son of Elkanah and Hannah. Uh, Hannah, you remember the, the one who was once barren. Uh, uh, Hannah was the one who prayed so fervently because her womb was not yet open and, and she had to deal with the other wife, Penina. Y'all remember the story? And, and, and God said that he would open her womb. And he gave her a child by the name of Samuel. And she said, God, if you give me a child, I promise you, I'll give him back to you. And so she gave him Samuel's life, his whole life. Thus, we find Samuel here at Shiloh ministering under Eli in the temple. And chapter 2 tells us that, that he was ministering since he was a boy. Uh, he was wearing a linen ephod and, and each and every year his mother made him a little robe and he took it to him every year when they went for the annual, annual sacrifice. But, but the problem was the word of God was rare and there were no visions in the land which my brothers and sisters was a sign that there was a problem with the priesthood of the nation of Israel. I'll say it again, you may have missed it. There was a problem with the priesthood of the nation of Israel and Samuel was working under the leader. 
And the Bible tells us in verse 2 that, that, that one night Eli, whose eyes were becoming weak, so weak that, that he could barely see. He was blind and he was lying down in his usual place. Now, now, now scholars suggest that Eli was weak and barely seeing, not only physically, but spiritually. Uh, why do we know this? Because the text lets us know that, that his sons were doing ill and their roles as priests. His son, Hophni and Phinehas, uh, they, they were some scoundrels, the chapter 2 says. Now, 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 let me tell you what they were doing. Let me tell you how trifling they was. Uh, the priests of the time were able to take a certain portion of sacrifice according to law. And so when people came in to render their sacrifices, they would be boiled in the water and they could take a three pitch fork and stick it in the water and whatever the fork brought out was for them. Can I teach the text? Yeah, yeah. Now, 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 the problem is, is that Eli's two sons were greedy yeah. and they were exploiters. And so what they would do was before the fat was even burned, they would tell someone and tell their servants to give them fresh meat because they didn't even allow it to get sacrificed. Well, well, well. And they would force people in and not even allow them to burn their first fruits and their first sacrifice. And they said they wanted whatever they could take. Hear these two men, men of the cloth of the family of the priesthood. They were promised that they would be priests forever, exploiting and taking advantage of people who are bringing their sacrifice willingly. Well, well, well. That's their first issue. Yep. The second issue is that they were having sexual relations with women that were serving in the temple. So here it is, the priests who represent God are taking advantage of people and having sexual promiscuity in the temple. Y'all gonna get quiet on me, that's okay. Uh, and, and I came to let you know that, that, that there are some things that God is not happy with and, and you can't stand from this mantle and exploit God's people and misdirect their understanding. So the text tells us that Eli was spiritually weak. He was blinded, not only physically, but, but the darkness had closed on his spirit. And isn't that a bad place to be when the darkness closes in on your spirit? Because when that happens, you all of a sudden start to turn a blind eye to some things that you would have spoke up on. I know I'm talking right. All of a sudden, you start to let folk who close to you slide with some things you know are wrong. And, and you won't say anything, but I came to let you know that if you're going to do the work for God, you got to be able to stand up for justice and truth, even if it's your own family. Um, it's okay. Uh, the lamp, text says the lamp of God had not gone out yet. Eli sleep in his usual place. And, and Samuel is lying down by the Ark of the Covenant and the Ark of God in the house of the Lord. And now it was customary. It was customary because it, it seems to fly past that. It was customary for, for the priest to burn lamps in the sanctuary from the evening until the morning according to Exodus 27. Which meant that it was dark, but yet there was still the light of God. And scholars suggest that there are multiple meanings to this light and darkness dichotomy that is presented in this text. See, the text says the lamp had not yet gone out, which means that it burned through the mist of the night. Eli, Eli is near his blindness. And the text says they found him sleeping in his usual place with no proximity to the divine. Well. Which suggests to us that Eli was living and ministering in darkness. Well. 
And watch, watch the text. It says, but Samuel was sleeping near the ark of God. Let me help you. The ark of God represented illumination. It represented enlightenment. It represented light. So, so, so here's Eli, the priest, living and sleeping blind in the darkness away from the ark and Samuel laying by the ark of the covenant where the lamp of God had not gone out yet. Y- y- y'all getting this thing? But because the light had not yet been extinguished, there was still hope that was present for the people of God. I I came to preach to somebody in this place who's been in some darkness right now. And the light is very, very dim. I came to let you know long as the light is still burning, there's still hope for you. There's still hope that God can illumine your path and bring you into his his glory. They, They were sleeping. And the text tells us that the Lord called Samuel. Eli is the priest, but the Lord calls Samuel. Now, now the Jewish historian Josephus writes in his work, The Antiquities of the Jews, book five, that, that Samuel was about 12 years old. And so he's a young man at this time who's developing under leadership. And the Bible says that once Samuel hears the voice, he says, here I am. And he runs to Eli and lets him know, did you call me? And Eli says, no, son, I didn't call you. God speaks to Samuel again, Samuel, Samuel. Eli jumps up. Samuel jumps up, runs to Eli. Eli, did did you call? You called me. And Eli, can you imagine him baffled? What is this boy talking about? I didn't call him. Again, the Lord says, Samuel. Samuel got up and, and he went to Eli and said, man, here I am. You, you keep calling me. And Eli said, go back and lay down. I didn't call you. And the Bible says Samuel did not yet know the Lord. So he wasn't able to understand the voice that was being revealed to him. So when the Bible says he's called a third time, Samuel gets back up, runs to Eli, and he gets to Eli, and he says, you called me one more time. Eli figures out something's going on. That's right, that's right. Something's actually happening right now. Because uh-huh. he, he, he recognized that Samuel was hearing a voice, and either Samuel was having some issues, well. or something else was happening. Yeah. And the Bible says that, 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 that Samuel didn't know the Lord, but Eli did. And so it triggered Eli's imagination to understand that which he already knew. And I think that brings me to my first point, Pastor, because sometimes we confuse the voices of those we respect and admire with the voice of God. Can I build this thing? Uh, sometimes we, 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 we confuse the voices of the folk we look up to and admire with the voice of God. Samuel repeatedly and repeatedly responded and ran to Eli. And no matter how many times he heard a voice, he ran straight to Eli. Now, now we can admire this young 12-year-old boy's discipline and his humility and we can understand his yearning to want to appease the one who's been mentoring and taking care of him. And facially, it's evident that he couldn't distinguish the difference between God speaking and Eli speaking. 
And may I suggest to you, 12 Baptists, that we must be careful to not allow or confuse the voices of those who have power in our lives to take the place of the one who gave us life. Which means that Samuel heard the call, but he was reporting to the wrong person. Well. Samuel heard the voice, but, but he was reporting to the one that didn't call him. Yeah. And may I suggest that we must be spiritually aware not to render our allegiance to report to those who did not call us. Well. May I suggest that many of us may be hearing God's voice, but we've been giving our power to folk that didn't call us for that task, and we find ourselves vulnerable, not ready, and we see that which we thought God had for us go down the drain. Because the one who was speaking to you didn't call you. The one who was speaking to you wasn't the one you reported to. And so the one you reported to didn't know what to do with what God placed on your heart and placed in your vision and placed in your mind. And, and now you're wondering, God, why are things falling apart? Because I didn't tell you to report to. Can, can I push this thing? I'm going to get out of here. Um, I, I want to shatter some, some spiritual assumptions in here today, Rem Brown. Can, can I help us out real fast? Just because a person may be godly, it does not mean that everything they say is always coming from God. I got to say that one more time. Just because somebody represents God doesn't always mean they speaking for God. And, and may I suggest to you that, that we've got to mature as Christians to know that we can discern when God is speaking and when somebody just talks. I knew you was going to get mad right there. That's all right. I'll shout by myself. Is there anybody in this place that can testify that I am a product of discerning God from call? Um, Eli was the priest, but he wasn't the one who called him. And so I got a little compassion on Samuel because we knew in verse 7 that he had not known the Lord yet. But Eli did. And because Eli knew the Lord, he knew who was calling him. And the Bible says Eli realized that the Lord was calling him. I think that brings me to my next point because I got to give Eli some credit right here. Because when you know what to do to help somebody get through what they're going through, then you ought to willingly deliver and be a helping hand. <laughs> Let me tell you why this is way more Credible on Eli's part than one might realize. It was not only of custom, but of, of what was seemingly divine right, that the only ones who received the voice of God for the children of Israel would be the prophet of Israel, the priesthood. So he was invested with both power and voice to hear directly from God, to give a spiritual acknowledgement to the people, whether it was judgment or edification. Well. And so the problem arises that now the one who's leading in the temple is no longer receiving the voice from God. Okay. That get me excited right there, y'all. Eli was supposed to get this 
But now God is speaking to Samuel because Eli has not done what he was supposed to do in his position to uphold the responsibilities to keep hearing from God. And so here's the conundrum Eli really is in. Now I can say I know what this boy is going through but because I want to keep my power and position I'm not going to help him understand how to get through it. Eli had a decision to make. I'm either going to tell him how to get through this situation because I know exactly what it's like to hear God speaking into my life and leading me to where I need to go or I'm going to ignore it and act like he's crazy. Well, <laughs> And the reason I like Eli right here because he recognizes that he has not only the experience but the responsibility to let Samuel know exactly what he needs to know to get through what he's going through. Yeah. So watch what Eli says. He says, this is the Lord speaking. He says, Samuel, this is what I want you to do. Go lie down. And if he calls you, Say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And may I propose to some seasoned saint in the church today that when you see a young person grappling and going through something you've already been through, you need to be willing, open, and ready to help them figure it out the way you figured it out. You need to tell them the words they need to say, give them the, the skills they need to have, equip them with the tools that they need because there's no reason they should go through the same problems that you know how to get out of. So you, you, you got to be willing to help somebody. But here, here's the real rub. I, th I thought about this thing, y'all. Um, the real issue comes here. Because the reason some folk don't want to help nobody is not only because they're, they're holding on to something that they, that they really don't own themselves. But the real reason they don't want to help nobody because sometimes they don't want the person that they're going to help to be better than them. And I came to get the enemy out this place to let you know that if God is speaking, if God is changing, if God is transforming, who are you to get in God's way? I know if I tell them this, they're going to turn it around quicker than I did. Well, well, well. I know if I tell them this, that they might get a better job than I got. I know if I tell them this, they, they might take my place. And many of reasons we don't want to go and do what God is calling us to do because we're more worried about our own self-interest than worried about God's spiritual liberation. But I came to help somebody to let you know when God is speaking, you ought to add it here. So the Lord, so watch, watch how good God is. He, uh, he speaks again to Samuel. He says, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel does exactly what Eli told him to do to figure out this getting up four and five times in the middle of the night. He says, speak for your servant is listening. And the Bible says that, that the Lord stood at, that, at Samuel's door. And no longer was God distant from him, but he stood at his door. 
and he said to Samuel, see, I'm about to do something that's going to make the ears tingle throughout all of Israel. And he said, I'm about to carry out exactly against Eli what I told him I would do because the scoundrels of his sons were messing with my people and exploiting them. And I called them to a priestly responsibility. So I'm going to judge the family forever. And, and because of these sins that he knew about, I'm going to deal with his line and all that comes after in his posterity. He says the guilt of Eli's house will, will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. And he gives him this heavy news. And he says, Samuel, go lay back down until the morning and then he opened the doors of the Lord Sam, Samuel is in a tough situation because the very one who nurtured him who raised him up the one who's mentored him now has received a prophecy that damns him And now Samuel is in a tough situation because Eli has called him again. But this time he's bearing some bad news. Samuel, Samuel. Samuel didn't scream as loud this time. Here I am. What is it the Lord said to you, Samuel? He said, don't hide nothing from me. Give it to me straight. God will deal with you severely if you don't tell me exactly what he told you. And don't withhold anything. And I think that brings me to the third point. Because when you finally hear the word of God speaking to you, Sometimes you're going to have to deliver some messages that will convict those who are close to you. So, the Bible says Samuel told him everything. That God is going to judge you. That God is not happy with what your sons did. He let them know that they did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. But, but Eli was a man of God. He knew he let his son slide. He knew he didn't say nothing when he was supposed to say something. He knew that even when he addressed them in the second chapter, it was just a scolding, but he didn't stop them. He knew that if he wanted to protect God's people, he would have sat them down and got them out of the way. But he allowed for the abuse and the exploitation to continue and happen under his watch. And no matter how holy he wanted to appear to the people of God, everybody knew that his sons were causing havoc. And the text lets us know that no longer were they just his sons, but they were his responsibility because he was their boss. He was the priest who allowed for people to get hurt. He was the priest. And you can't be good and allow bad up under your nose. Lord was with Samuel. And what people don't really get, they only talk about the calling. But there's a jump between 18 and 19 where now Samuel is the one that grows up. And now Samuel is the one whose words don't ever fall to the ground. So literally in the shift of one verse, God took Eli from his power and restored order to Israel so Samuel could speak to his people. And when you're waiting to hear from God, when, when God skits to you and he speaks to you, then God will shift it so that the one who he needs will be able to speak to his people and bring about restoration. Yeah. 
And I really think that's a shout for us today because it don't matter who falls off their pedestal. It don't matter how high someone think they might get. God ain't never ran out of options to get his word to his people. Is there anybody in this place that recognize that God is always raising up a voice for his people? Can you hear me now? Um, I'm, I'm done. I hear this. Um, I, I, I used to watch a lot of TV, and I, I still watch a little bit. And, and, and now, if you've noticed, there, there was a, a brother who, who now works for Sprint, who are uh, doing these commercials that, that, that are kind of what we call trolling his former employer. But if you remember who he used to work for, he used to work for Verizon. Yeah, y'all know what I'm talking about. And in these commercials, he would go different locations all around the country and all around the world. And he'd literally just say, can you hear me now? Good. And everywhere he went, there was clarity enough so that the voice that he heard could get him the message. Y'all yeah, still think I'm talking about Verizon. Uh, everywhere the man went, he heard the voice clearly because he always had a connection because God don't need nobody's help to get his message to the people that he needs to get. And it don't matter where you go, how you get there, where you end up, God can speak and he'll say, can you hear me now? Good. Is there anybody in this place that can give God the praise because he's still speaking to his people? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Hear me now? Uh, he sent his son between four and two generations. Can you hear me now? He went up on a cross on a Friday with nails in his hands. Can you hear me now? They stretched him wide, put holes in his side and nails in his feet. Can, can you hear me now? He went down into a borrowed tomb, stayed there all night Friday and all night Saturday. Can you hear me now? They said he woke up one Sunday morning, early one Sunday morning with all power in his hands. Can you hear me now? He gave you love. He gave you peace. He gave you transformation. He gave us salvation. Can you hear me now? And there may be somebody who's hearing God's voice. He's asking that question. Can you hear me now? And hopefully, he'll be able to say, good, my faithful servant. You've been faithful over few things. I'm going to make you ruler over many things. He's moving. He's speaking, he's transforming. Hear his voice, hearken to his word, and trust that God will transform your life from the inside out. Come on, let's give God some praise. One more time.